Uh, thank you, Representative Potter. I also like to begin by thanking Representative Potter, Senator Henry, uh, activist uh, Liz Allen, and the great Dr. Louis McDowell. Thank you so much. First of all, I, I, uh, I don't want to cover everything that everybody's covered already uh, the, that got us in the position we are today. But one of the things that wasn't discussed this morning, we talked about minimum mandatory and the drug law, but one of the things that wasn't discussed was the truth and sentence of law. Does everybody know what truth and sentence and law is? No. Truth and sentence, basically in 1989, they passed the truth and sentence and law. And that more or less did away with the role of the parole board. That meant that instead of being eligible for parole after you served one third of your sentence, you were no longer eligible for parole. You had proof and sentence, you had to do the sentence that you were given. The only way you would be able to change your sentence would be through sentence modification. And the parole board would, was allowed to not rule on, on a sentence modification, but give a recommendation to the sentencing judge on sentence modification. And that changed in 1989, that law was passed in 1989. And anybody sentenced after 1990 would fall under the truth and sentencing law. <coughs> We've seen because of the truth and sentencing law, before we, you were eligible for parole, you went before the parole board and the parole board was more or less allowed to uh, discuss, you know, what do you have on the outside as far as reentry is concerned and set up systems for you for reentry. We no longer have that when the truth and sentence of law was passed. That was, when the truth and sentence of the law was passed, we were spending something like $80 million a year on corrections. Does anybody have any idea what this year's recommended budget for the corrections department is? What is it? $280 some million. $273 million, the governor's recommended budget for correction this year. $273 million. It was 268 million last year. This year is $273 million. That's how much money we're, we're spending in corrections. And we're good in the state of sending people to jail. We have, a mass, excuse me, we have a mass incarceration problem in the country. We, we incarcerate more people in any country in the world. We have a mass incarceration problem in the, in the country. And it's even more in the state of Delaware. At any given time, you have at least 7,000 people in level five incarceration. 20,000 people in the system in the state, it's this small state of Delaware, where you only have a million people, citizens in the state of Delaware. But we have those kind of numbers that are incarcerated. And another thing I wanted to mention before I go any further, we talked about the incarcerated, the offender of incarcerated, and the effect it has on the, that offender. One of the things that wasn't mentioned this morning, I like to mention it, because I have to deal with it almost on a daily basis, is the effect on the offender's family. Because when your son does time or your daughter does time, guess what? You're doing time too. And it has a strong effect on that parent. I get calls almost on a daily basis, and it's mainly from the most and the grandmothers about their child being in prison. It has a negative effect on them. I got, and I can speak personally for myself. My brother was in jail and it had a negative effect on my mother. I think it sent her to an early grade worried about my brother being in jail. So 
When we talk about incarceration and, and the effect that it has on the offender, let's think about how it affects the family also. Because it probably affects the family even more so. But one of the other things I want to mention, and I, like I said, I want to thank Representative Potter as well as Senator Henry for sponsoring this legislation. But I want to take exception to what Mr. Abrams said earlier when he pointed at it and said, you representatives need to get behind this. Sometimes you need to know who your friends are. Yeah. You need to know the people that supported you throughout the years. And I think about Senator Henry. I've only been in the legislation for 10 years, but Senator Henry's down there before me. And the things that she had to put up with in order to get some legislation passed. He spoke about how a offender or an ex-felon wasn't allowed in, in the housing development. Guess what? An ex-offender wasn't allowed to receive food stamps. If he was convicted, no, not an ex-felon, uh, but if he was convicted of drugs, you weren't allowed to, to uh, receive food stamps. You know who changed that law, who sponsored legislation to change that law? Senator Henry. <laughs> we talk about reforming the, uh, the, the drug sentencing laws. We had a bill passed in the last session, House Bill 19. If you get a chance, look at House Bill 19. And and uh, Dr. McDowell is, is, is correct. We try to work on issues um, in increments, and sometimes they don't work. And sometimes we have to go back and make subtle changes. But we passed the law in, in the last se session, in uh, 146 General Senate, HB 19. And that reformed some of the uh, drug sentence law. It, erase the minimal mandatory uh, sentencing zone some law. And you know who sponsored that legislation? Senator, I mean, Representative Melanie Smith. Melanie Smith, she, she's a supporter. You have a supporter here, a legislator here, a recently new legislator, a freshman, that has been fighting not only the, the Republicans, but the Democrats in our cause, as it pertains to education. And her name is Kim Williams. Kim. Kim Williams. Kim Williams. Because we got to begin with education. And you're not, you need to know who your friends are. Who's been fighting for education for our kids for years? George Evans, stand up, George. We have Drew Film sitting in the back trying to hide. They not only fought for the un underprivileged with the ACLU, but she's doing it now with CJC. Stand up, Drew. She's a friend. Yeah, Brendan O'Neill, public defender. And, and you may have read some news in the paper uh, uh, a couple of days ago about the public defender's office. Well, let me tell you, you cannot blame it on the public defender's office. You cannot blame it on the public defender. You have to blame it on the state and the judiciary system and the way we set it up. One of the things, one of the big issues and one of the big problems that we're having in the uh, public defender's office now is the conflict of interest. I mean, conflict attorneys. Guess what? We changed that two years ago where the conflict attorneys were in the court system. So we thought we were going to make a big change and address that issue by putting a conflict attorney in the public defender's office. Now we're running into a new problem. We're running into, now we will blame the public defender's office when we should be blaming all of us. All of us are probably involved in that. So just don't blame the public defenders all. Thank you for doing a great job, Brittany. All right. We're going to move on to the honorable. Are there any things to say about you? I wasn't finished with you. Oh, yeah, no, no. No, go ahead and finish. He's wound up here. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Let's go. Go ahead. 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 Go ahead.
the, the bottom line is you have friends in the, in the General Assembly, you have friends in the public, and we need to embrace our friends, and I support the legislation, and I wish everyone the best. All right, thank you. We're poor here too. So why do we have to have it? And that, this is something that really needs to be looked into. I want to thank J.J. Johnson. I know you want to speak. But I'm going to thank you. Give me a chance. And I'm going to thank Senator Henry because I did bring this up at a meeting. And I also want to thank Kathleen McCray because there is something that's being looked into. Hopefully this will change. I don't think it's fair that two um, institutions don't have it, but yet we have it here, but we struggle too to keep uh, money uh, in, in for other ones. I, I really hope that's addressed. Now, we, we, we're going to address that, but we want to stay focused on the bill, but he will address that. Go ahead, Dick uh, Thank you, uh, Representative Potter. Uh, Josie, yeah. you brought that issue to me before in a meeting. You also brought it to Senator Henry. And I had told Henry, Senator Henry that we addressed that issue in the Joint Finance Committee meeting. Yeah. And I asked her to get back with you. Apparently, Senator Henry didn't get back with you. <laughs> but anyway, we we're going to address that issue. And first of all, like I said earlier, I'm chairman of the correction committee. And issues, and issues like that come before me. I try my best to address them. You can agree to that, Joseph. Yes, I can. And when I have issues, I go right to the source. Just like yesterday, I spent the day yesterday afternoon over to Dolores Bell because they had a problem over there at Unit 9. And I went over there to address that issue. We are addressing your issue with the kiosks. We don't think it's fair. And, and like I said er earlier, getting back to what I was telling you earlier, you have friends in a general assembly and you need to find out who your friends are. The first person that brought that issue up uh, to, was to, to address that issue was Senator Karen Peterson. She was also the one to address it, the issue when the, the family was being victimized with the uh, telephone calls, how they was paying outrageous uh, uh, money for the telephone calls. And we were going to address that issue the same way. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Representative Biden. Uh, I want to go back to what Marla Harris had said earlier about the youth offenders. And we should be taking the opportunity when we have a youth offender in our custody to make sure that they don't become a, a adult offender. And I have, currently I have legislation in, in the House, and it's House Bill 226. And it's an act to amend Title 11 and Title 29 of the Delaware Code relating to specialized probation and parole officers assigned to the Division of Youth Health, Youth Rehabilitation Services. And the synopsis of the legislation is, it says that the role of the juvenile probation officer in the serious juvenile offender unit is not to act as a police officer, but rather to engage and work with youth and their family while maintaining public safety. Rather than mirroring public a police training in all respects, the training requirements of the probation officer should mirror the training of adult. In other words, we should take this opportunity when we have a, a youth offender, make sure he gets the proper counseling and training and education to ensure that he doesn't become adult offender. And this is what this legislation does. HB 226. 